Hey everyone, it's been a while. Thought I'd take a minute and uh, shoot a video and show off this uh, 1943 Sydney lathe that Dad and I finished restoring. Uh, it's a 16 by 54, so it actually swings 18 and a half and it'll swing 54 inches between centers. It's a very solid machine, uh, in many ways typical of your average uh, World War II machine. Um, in some ways very much not so. It's pretty heavy, it's about 5,000 pounds. It's got a clutch, just a one-way, no reverse clutch. Um, full, range, full range of feeds and speeds, about everything you'd expect on a lathe of this caliber. One of the most unusual things though about this lathe is that the headstock is completely herringbone gears for the drivetrain. There's no spur gears in it, there's no helicals, it's all herring bones. Uh, I've got a separate video link in the cards if you'd like to see what those look like. Uh, hopefully I put a picture in this video, but they're pretty neat and that's part of the reason I wanted this lathe. It's pretty slow spindle speed, it runs between 14 and 562. I've currently got it running about 40% faster because I went from a 1200 to an 1800 RPM motor. When we found this machine, it was a total wreck. Uh, really shouldn't have bought it. It belongs in a scrapyard even, even to this day, to be honest. Uh, it's more of, a, more of a piece of art than a usable tool in some aspects. It's quite worn out in uh, every regard. Every single piece of it has wear. Even the headstock's got some damage where people left some bearing lock nuts loose in it and the gears were allowed to sit there and wobble which resulted in some wear and damage to the gears. So unfortunately, even though all the gears are herringbone, it's actually quite a noisy machine. So yeah, let me show you around it. So I'll start off with the power. Uh, we had to completely do the power system on this from scratch. Uh, we put a new motor in it, had a single phase. It didn't come with a motor actually. Um, and so we put a three phase motor in it and uh, set up all these controls. I got a separate video on that. Uh, link it in the cards. Um, but we got a nice electrical on it now. Motor's unfortunately pretty noisy. It's a modern three phase, not a great quality one. You can hear it there. It makes quite a bit of noise. In fact, it's uh, louder than most lathes are just running, just in idle. Uh, so that comes in through a clutch. kind of pull it. It gives real good modulation. You can really kind of set it to what you want it to be. Uh, and then you got your standard array of headstock gears. Of course I can't shift through them one-handed. Uh, it's got this really got this really beefy feed gut box, uh, real heavy duty, I like it. Um, pretty much your standard high-low range here. This is your intermediate adjuster, each notch doubles it, and then you got your tumbler, of course. It's got a lever for threads and feeds, and then it's got this rod as well. And This is a bit of an unusual feature because it's actually a lead screw reverse powered by this handle right here. And what that allows you to do is reverse the thread direction while keeping it in time. So you can sit here and pop this lever back and forth and move the carriage along without losing the thread timing. Um, so that's an alternate way to cut threads instead of using half nuts. The slave has a well optioned apron. It has individual feed clutches instead of a combined one and you are able to engage both of them at the same time. Also unusual is most lays when the carriage moves to the left the cross slide would normally move out. That is not the case with this lathe. Instead if you engage them both together you'll see that it moves left and in. Uh, that's a pretty unusual feature and some people like that less because they like to 
finish a longitudinal cut and then face outward. So I kind of like it more because I don't have to change the direction as much. Normally you could swap the direction to the other side using the opposite side of the bevel gear. This one does not have that option, it's blocked off because they instead expect you to use the lead screw reverse. Um, you got a clutch handle for the main spindle clutch there and at the headstock. Uh, tailstock has seven inches of travel and a more tape at four. This one has been badly butchered and I need to repair it. The quill's all loose. Um, also it was cracked and I had to do a massive weld repair there. It's got a pretty nice steady. Haven't used that yet. The main issue with this lathe is that it's just it's totally and completely worn out. I don't know what I was looking at when I inspected it, but you can sit there and thop it back and forth and I can't adjust the uh, cross slide any tighter and maintain full travel. Um, if you look down in here, but you can see quite a gap there. It's getting close to an eighth inch and that should be tight. So between the the bed wear and the wear in the carriage, um, it's down about a hundred thousandths of an inch, which is atrocious. Uh, these are things I didn't know to check for when I was first inspecting this lathe, but you know I've learned a lot since then, and, and I would not buy this machine again. There's, it works okay for OD turning, works great for roughing. But for boring and other precision work, it's really difficult to get anything within a thousandths or whatever. Especially to keep it from running tapers. So now I've told you about it, let's take it through a couple of gears. Start low gear, should be 14, it's about 20 RPM.
percent kick out with these little stop collars. It's certainly a very neat machine and it's got a lot of wonderful features. Um, you know, I love the spindle clutch, I love these easy to use apron clutches. Uh, I really like the idea of the lead screw reverse, I love the auto stop, I like the nice big dials, the really heavy duty compound and everything. I love that the apron and the cross slide self oil. Um, it's got nice felt way wipers. The Quick change gearbox, while not as good as some because it's not oil bath, it is at least self-oiling to most ports. You put a little oil in here, put a little oil in here, and that's it. So there's really not that many oil ports in the machine. You got two there, one there, one there, um, you know, a couple here and on the cross slide, a couple on the tailstock, and a few on the end of the lathe here, but that's just about it. It's, it's really not that that bad uh, compared to little lathes where you have to oil every single thing by yourself. Of course, it's not quite as good as the later ones where you had the oil bath quick change gearbox. But what really, really killed this lathe is many, many years of neglect and just an incredible, unbelievable amount of usage. I mean, it must have been a favorite lathe for operators or whatever plan it was at because you're just not going to see the sort of wear even on abused machines that you know don't get oiled and don't get taken care of just to have it so uniform you know not just the ways but in the quick change gearbox in the headstock in the compound in the nuts in the apron I, there's worn out tapered roller bearings in the apron uh you know the tailstock barrel the tailstock barrel is just about loose enough you can thump it about by hand. Uh, they had to shorten it by about an inch because I guess the, the face of it got all beaten up or something. You know, just to have this sort of wear just took an incredible amount of use. 40,000 hours probably, maybe more, I, I don't know. Um, it's, it's both unfortunate but it's respectable. I mean that this lathe could have served such a long service life and even in the state it's in it's still going it still does the occasional job it's still capable even even for that extreme amount of wear so I certainly respect it I wouldn't buy one again I wouldn't go through this process so Sydney was really bought to complement this little 10 inch Rockwell which is not much lathe it's only one horsepower um, and, and just can't take a whole lot of cut so the idea was to have a big lathe for big work and a little lathe for little work and pick the best one for the job for in-between work. Um, however, in the middle of restoring Sydney, Dad picked up this uh, Lagoon 1440 for a really unbelievable price. And this machine's kind of a sweetheart. Um, had a few problems with it, but it's just about totally unworn and it cuts really nice and true. It's really nice to run and it runs uh, cuts metric threads with zero change gears so this has probably contributed to more of the lack of use of the Sydney than anything else because I like to do accurate and tight work and if there's a better machine for the job then I'm gonna use the better machine so generally the Sydney has been uh, 
only used for roughing work and anytime I try do try to use it for precision work it ends up a bit disappointing. It took Dad and I about nine months to go through it and a lot of hours and a lot of machining and welding and uh, cleaning. Uh, there's full logs on Garage Journal, Practical Machinist, and the BBS Home Shop Machinist, the one with the magazine. Um, if, you, if you're interested in reading through, I'll link some of those in the description. Um, but just a, a tremendous project and not all that much gain, unfortunately. A lot of learning, a lot of learning about what not to do, which would be to purchase a lathe in this condition. Um, inspections are key and I wish I had spent a lot more time inspecting it. I guess that's my takeaway for this video is to really inspect any piece of machinery you're going to get and, and don't get all beard goggled because it has a couple of herringbone gears in it. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's about how it works and how noisy it is and how smooth it is and how much repairing it's going to need. You know, don't don't get romantic with a machine unless you have the funds and the space available to have a piece of artwork, which I, I think it is. I think it's gorgeous. Uh, it's a shame it can't be an extremely functional piece of artwork as well and only a, only a moderately functional piece. But it is what it is. It's done. And I um, hope you enjoyed the video and a little bit of a closure for those that have seen my two previous updates on this and, and never saw the final product. So here it is. If I can get around to it, I'll make a, a video on how to thread with this lead screw reverse. At the end of this video, I will leave some clips of the machining I have done with this. And it's done some pretty heavy cuts, so I'll, I'll respect it for that. With that, uh, take care, and I'll see you next time.